Hello everyone, I am Hayabal and today I shall be talking about our work on emulating trust zone to enable dynamic analysis. This is work uh, with my colleagues at Samsung North, Lee Harrison and Michael Grace, and our collaborators from UC Berkeley, Rohan Pardier and Professor Kaushik Sen. Now, uh, most of us have one kind of a smartphone or the other. Uh, when we think of the software that runs on a smartphone, uh, say in the case of an Android phone, that we will, uh, what comes to our mind is probably an Android application, the Android framework, and perhaps the Linux kernel. However, it would surprise a lot of us to know that there is an entirely different and parallel software stack that runs in the background that is actually responsible for the security of the phone. And this is called Trust Zone, and it's the topic of our discussion today. So Trust Zone runs its own operating system, runs its own applications called TS. Uh, and the uh, Trust Zone is uh, otherwise called the trusted execution environment or the secure world, whereas all the other software is called the normal world or the rich execution environment. The secure monitor allows switching between the normal world and the secure world and vice versa. So the special thing about Trust Zone is that it has access to uh, hardware crypto keys. Only the Trust Zone has access and not the normal world and this is hardware enforced. Because of such privileged access, uh, so software needs to be signed to be able to run in Trust Zone. So uh, the ability to execute software in Trust Zone is very tightly regulated because obviously it forms the basis for security. Now, what does this mean for dynamic analysis of Trust Zone? Let's take a look. Dynamic analysis needs the ability to monitor or introspect the target in some way, perhaps through instrumentation. Debugging, for example, needs to uh, uh, access memory and registers. Feedback-driven fast testing needs access to the list of the basic blocks executed as a result of feeding a particular piece of input. Unfortunately, because of uh, Trust Zone requiring software to be signed, uh, software cannot be changed in any way and therefore you cannot instrument or monitor uh, TZ execution. Therefore, dynamic analysis in Trust Zone is very limited. So to solve this problem, we built an emulator that runs real-world Trust Zone operating systems and TS. Obviously, through emulation, we have complete control of the execution environment, so we can introspect, emulate, and do virtually anything. We support currently these four widely used real-world operating systems shown on the slide. So how did we actually uh, run Trust Zone in the emulator? So there are a large number of components on typical smartphones. So uh, you have the normal world software components, you have the secure world software components, and on top of that, you have a wide variety of hardware components and dependencies between all of these components. The traditional approach to emulation is just to shove all software or firmware into the emulator and emulate any hardware that it requires to run. So this would mean emulating all the hardware components shown in yellow. And this is very impractical. In fact, even just the storage controller, it's very difficult to emulate uh, usually given how quickly it changes and uh, how intricate it is. Therefore, we cannot choose this approach. We need another approach. And our approach is to carefully select a subset of hardware and software components to emulate so that the person of it can run. Concretely, let's take a look at the dependencies between the trust zone OS, the bootloader, and the storage. Now, the bootloader reads the trust zone OS image from the storage during boot time. And this is obviously uh, a complex dependency given how uh, intricately the storage controller uh, is tied to the bootloader. And therefore, this is a what we would call a tightly coupled or difficult to emulate dependency. On the other hand, let's look at what the bootloader uh, does to the Trust Zone OS. Once the bootloader reads the Trust Zone OS from the storage, it simply loads the Trust Zone OS in memory, sets up the boot parameters, 
and jumps to the trust zone OS to start its execution. So this is relatively straightforward, well-defined. And this is what we would call a loosely coupled dependency, and it's easier to emulate. Therefore, we our approach is to emulate the bootloader using the stub uh, that uh, performs all the required operations that the person OS expects of the bootloader. And therefore, we completely eliminate the need to emulate each storage controller. And we do this similarly for all the other components that the trust zone OS depends on. And we find out what is an optimal uh, um, combination of components to emulate to support the trust zone OS. So this is the first step of our approach. Once we've done this, we actually have to emulate these components. Fortunately and surprisingly, we find that most of the emulation effort is feasible using very simple and straightforward patterns. Uh, hardware, for example, requires uh, a few several patterns that are shown on the slide. So you have the read pattern, which just means whenever the MMIO location is read, return a constant value. Similarly, the write pattern, which returns the last value written to that location, and so on. So these are straightforward. Even for software, so you have the bootloader structure as well as the secure monitor shown here, and they also have similar patterns where you uh, when an API is called, you return either a constant or the last value written and so on. We implemented our hardware emulation within QEMU. Uh, and we used Panda, which gives us a modularized framework uh, that we implemented the AFL module and also a module to debug TAs. The actual TA and the trust OS run within the guest. Uh, and there's a small driver that is responsible for interfacing between uh, or with the module and reading the input, feeding it to the TA, detecting a crash, and so on. So what did we actually learn from this study? We did a large-scale study of TAs uh, that we extracted from 16 firmware images across 12 uh, smartphone and IoT vendors. We ended up with a corpus of close to 200 unique TAs, and we ran AFL on them using our uh, emulator. We found that AFL actually crashed 48 of these TAs. So on manual analysis and reverse engineering of the TAs uh, of these crashes, we found three specific coding patterns that led to these crashes, and we'll go into them. The first pattern was that the TA made assumptions about the request sequence coming in from the client application. Now, TAs usually split work into very small chunks so as to not monopolize the CPU, and therefore they uh, work in this way where they receive a series of requests for very simple actions. Now, a benign client will send these requests in order, but a malicious client is not constrained to do so, and so uh, a malicious client in the normal world could send an out of order request. If the TA does not handle that properly, it could crash or uh, worse yet uh, be exploitable. And so the first takeaway is that the TA should properly handle sequence of it, uh, any sequence of requests uh, without assuming the, a particular sequence from the CA. The second anti-pattern we came across was Un unvalidated uh, normal world pointer. So the TA and the CA, of course, they run in separate address spaces. Uh, in some TZOS implementations, they communicate through shared memory that is mapped into both of their address spaces. Now, obviously, where this shared memory is mapped into the TA, it's not known to the CA. But by design, certain OSs require this to be passed back to the CA. So the CA can construct pointers into the shared memory that can be uh, conveniently used by the TA directly because it already refers to subject space. However, malicious clients are not constrained to give a pointer within the shared memory and they could give a pointer anywhere within the TA address space. And this could lead to integrity and confidentiality violations. So the TA should check that the CA supplied pointers point to shared memory. The third pattern we found was quite similar. The global platform API allows four parameters to the TA in a single call, and this could 
each of these parameters can either be a value or a buffer. Now, here is a TA that uh, expects the first parameter to be a buffer. However, uh, a malicious client could give a value and that could point to anywhere in the TS memory. And again, leading to similar consequences as the previous pattern. Therefore, the TA should check the CA supply parameter types to make sure it expects it uh, or the parameter types are what the TA expects. So in conclusion, we showed that it is practically feasible to run real world trust zone OSS in an emulator. Large scale uh, study of TAs showed how useful this technique is. And we identified vulnerability patterns that are unique to TA development, pointing to the need for TA specific developer education. Thank you for your attention.